SL error. So this talk is pretty tightly packed, um, so I have to run through some of the slides. I may have some time for question and answer at the end, but I'm not sure yet. So let's go. Storyline. Well, looks like that doesn't work. Hey, so the idea is maybe you're an engineer, you're just on vacation, or like here, that's the venue of PyCon Russia I've been the last couple of days, enjoying your day at a pool, relaxing, maybe having a cocktail, super great, yeah, fantastic, final vacation, and then your pager goes off, you see, oh no, SSL error. <clears throat> you run to your room, already annoyed, check the logs, and you see something like that, totally gibberish, wow, what's going on here? So I will give you a bit of pointers what may go wrong, and on the line also explain how TLS SSL works on a high level, including the handshake and certificates. So, my name is Christian Heimes. I'm from Hamburg, Germany. I've been working with Linux and Python for a pretty long time. I'm also a core developer working on the security team maintainer of the SSL model at Red Hat. My professional life were actually make running. I uh, work also in security engineering on identity management stack, uh, single sign on solutions called Free IPA and related. So, the stock. I'll first we'll give you a short history of SSL, a very high level view, a quick way how the connection works, including short intermezzo, Crypto 101. Uh, after we have the handshake done, I'll like, explain certificates a bit, uh, how the root CAs work, hosting verification. Then I'll, at the end, I'll give you some pointers like resources, links to books, and tools you can use, and hopefully maybe some questions. But before we start, should you actually lose, uh, deploy and use TLS? Um, there's one very short answer to that. It's yes. But the bit longer answer is uh, yes, you should. Because TLS has just one big issue. It's actually not performance but it's just not used widely enough yet. So there's a website, if you consider about performance, is TLS fast yet, that explain to you why TLS is actually fast enough, usually it's sometimes faster. Try Hunt, make this nice graph, so it's downloading a big website with lots of resources over HTTP, it takes almost six seconds. If you do that in a modern browser with uh, HTTP2, it looks like that. Bam, done, one or two seconds much, much, much faster. Another reason is if you happen to update Chrome today, wow, very lucky, you will see that. Starting uh, like yesterday night or today's morning, depending when you update, uh, any kind of non-HTTPS link will give you a very big red warning box, not secure. Uh, several websites, including Google, also uh, give you much better page ranking when you use HTTPS, so there's lots of reasons. And these days, it's very easy to get a certificate for no money. Use Let's Encrypt. Fantastic tool. So history. Um, SL is sometimes a bit uh, confusing because you have like SSL, you have TLS, and actually one is greater than three. It's the first thing that people are confused when I talk to them about SSL and TLS, that one is bigger than three, and one or two is actually hex 303, yeah. SSL, TLS, sometimes start TLS. I'm not getting into that, it's actually not that complicated. Um, but yeah, the history. Back in the old ages, Netscape, 1993, 94, they wanted to start e-commerce, sending like credit card information over the internet, and they figured out they some way to encrypt that data. So they came up with SSL 1.0, which was never released. A bit later, they came out with SSL um, 2.0 in 1995, the first protocol that allowed uh, encryption on the internet as a standard in back then Netscape Navigator, which was not that good. So they figured out, oh, now we have to redesign the whole protocol to make SSL version 3. But at the same time, uh, the ITF, a standardization body, had also wanted to make that an official standard that works across multiple platforms and browsers. So they came up with the idea, let's standardize that, but let's give it a different name and restart the version numbers. It's only a very minor improvement a couple of years later, but they came up with a new name. And actually TLS 1.0 is uh, SSL 3.1 internally. 
A um, couple of years later, TLS 1.1, which uh, mitigated some attacks. Uh, 1.2 was a big step. Uh, Ten years ago, they added um, AAD and a better PRF. So the way how certain encryption works is now much better in TLS 1.2 than the older ones. And eventually, soonish, hopefully for four years now in standardization, is TLS 1.3 which hopefully comes out in a couple of months from now. Uh, the standard is, I think, finalized now, but they still had, like, the last two years' trouble with certain hardware boxes. There's several TLS SSL libraries you may encounter. For us, it's mostly important the OpenSSL library. The other libraries are used, like, in Windows and Apple products, but uh, Python users will mostly interact with OpenSSL through either the standard library SSL model or to PyOpenSSL. Um, yeah, these are the most important libraries. There's also written by Corey Benfield a secure transport for ULIP3 used in requests on macOS to use the Apple um, uh, search database internally. And just a quick look how it looks when you actually create a connection. And as with the model, you first need to create some configuration space that holds information, which kind of protocols you want to do, that's the, the context, can do that all that way, or you can do it manually. Uh, the first way is the preferred way. It gives you always a nicely secured configuration. We will also update that in case there's some kind of attacks. And then you have to create first the connection, later wrap the connection, and actually do the handshake. And then you can start uh, to send data over the wire. And now I will run you through what happens at the different stages here throughout the whole uh, rest of the presentation. So, high level view, what happens if you do a connection? So, and uh, how does a protocol work? The first thing that most people will see if, if you connect, you get this nice shiny green lock symbol. That means connection is secure. And people think often that TLS SSL is mostly about encryption, but actually it's much more than encryption. Um, there's a very long presentation uh, uh, definition by Wikipedia. Uh, I've highlighted some of the keywords. It's communication security, privacy, and also data integrity. So TLS SSL will not give you encryption, but also integrity of the data, so nobody can modify and tamper with the information, and also give you strong authentication and um, of the peer. So the core features of TLS SSL are um, encryption, what well, we, most people have already figured probably out. It's also interesting to know that it's protocol agnostic. You can run much more than just HTTP. You can run like email, you can IMAP, you can run your database connection over TLS SSL. And sometimes you use instead of TLS SSL, something called start TLS. That just means you first create the connection, do some communication, then upgrade your connection to an encrypted one. So that's start TLS. You also get the integrity check so that nobody can change your data. You get something called replay attack protection. Integra can't like record your bank transaction and send that a couple of times again later on to the bank to get more money from you. It's also protected. Uh, strong authentication of the server, that's the one thing you get with the certificates and this also shine greeny bar. And for enterprise users, if you like smart card authentication or server-to-server uh, -server authentication or for application backends, you can also use client certificates on the, on the client side. So the client can authenticate via the same kind of certificate as server certificate. Yeah. And it's extensible, which came very in handy for TLS 1.3 because it builds a partly new protocol on um, the actual old protocol. We got lots of different standards, just a couple of buzzwords uh, you will see throughout the next slides. And all this combination of different protocols and standards and network layers makes it rather hard to debug and understand what's going wrong. So it can go wrong on multiple layers, starting from the network, uh, crypto can go wrong, the certificates can go wrong, ASM1 is a rather complicated standard that the format you, the certificates are encoded in. And yeah, it's a bit of pain, but hopefully I will be able to explain some of the issues I see both in daily life with the maintainer SL model and at my work and help you to understand.
So, first of all, connection. First thing we do when we uh, have to talk to the server is connect to the server somehow. And during that connection, the initial handshake, we do three vital steps. First, we have to agree on some kind of parameters to like which protocol version we talk, which cipher suites we talk, and we have to authenticate the server so nobody can do a man on the middle attack. So there's no attacker that can just pretend to be like your bank or your email provider. And the last thing we need to do the actual encryption later on is agree on something called the pre-master secret. That's a shared secret that is then used to derive more secrets to do encryption and protection on the wire. So first thing, we have to look up the name, do a, a TCP handshake to establish a connection. Then the client sends some kind of hello. The server answers with another hello and some other fields I will fill in uh, later on. And finally, then the client sends something back. They do a bit of handshake. So you see it's like ping pong, ping pong, and only at the very end, we start the actual encrypted communication. Um, so that's make TLS a bit slow if you use it that way. It's also optimized in TLS 103, or if you use session resumption, which is a bit advanced topic, I'll can't talk during my talk. So first step, just establishing this initial um, TCP handshake, looking up the name, and setting the initial client hello. That can go wrong multiple ways already. So just get like a name and service unknown error. It usually means your uh, host name is unknown. So there's maybe some kind of DNS issues, made a typo. There's also connection refused. Maybe the server is down, maybe the network is down. So that happens on the TCP level. Sometimes you get the error message, wrong version number. Um, I'll come back to that later. Sometimes just you send something to the server and just kills the connection, error number zero, which is rather annoying. Or uh, in some cases, uh, it just blocks, hangs, and does nothing. It can be a whole different uh, list of issues, from firewall issues to network connectivity to some servers, even if you send something they don't understand, like new protocol version, they just block. They aren't playing nice. To get the hang of it, to see what's going on, and to diagnose the first kind of issues, I always start to first, like, look up the host name, can actually resolve it, maybe send a ping to the server. So ping just sends a ICMP package to the other peer, it replies. Uh, protocol comes from submarines, so the send is ping, and hopefully the server replies from there. It ha also helps to see if the basic network connection works. Uh, you can do like trace routing uh, that pings the different steps, so the routers and servers the request is routed through, that might help. And if nothing else works, you can still use a tool called TCP dump to look on the raw network layer, which is kind of a lot of gibberish and hard to read. I can't read that myself very well, but there's other tools I'll show you later that is very, uh, makes it much more approachable. So one tool you can use to diagnose the kind of issues when you're running on a server that I discovered just like a year ago is, who has heard of the tool curl, the downloader tool? Uh, it's just a uh, common tool, uh, tool to download resources. Also has two options, um, dash S, dash V, which gives you a enormous amount of information about the handshake. You see all the steps in the handshake on the console. So, so these tools, just to summarize them up, um, DNS lookup, ping, Wireshark, curl, W get. There's also nmap, port scanner you can figure out, which ports are open or if the firewall is blocked. Or uh, very, uh, if you have access to the server, just read the firewall logs, read the server logs if you see any kind of errors. Or if you have an HTTP server, well, just use your browser. Just try to connect to your server with your web browser and see if that works. Okay, we have the TCP connection now to the server. He sent the initial hello, and let's see how the handshake works internally. So again, we have the DNS lookup. We sent the client hello. The client hello 
this package we send as a first tells the server which kind of versions we can talk, which ciphers we could support, um, and some random value. And the server, when it can handle the information, um, sends back the server hello, and it sends back the information which ciphers you selected, which version is selected, and also random value. And from there on, we go on. And we had that a couple minutes ago. Uh, either wrong version number connection hangs. If um, the server doesn't reply with a server hello, or replies with this information wrong version number, that often means you may not actually talk to something that's an SSL or TLS server. Maybe you have misconfigured your Apache or an Nginx web server to not actually respond to HTTPS. It's something that is uh, rather common if you start to deploy a new server and something that's not very obvious. Uh, several other error messages you may get from OpenSSL are uh, um, fail to negotiate acceptable TLS parameters, handshake failure, that can mean that any kind of this information, what you support as a client, is not understandable by the server, and there's some kind of policy the server tells you, I don't like to talk to you with these parameters. There's no way to get more information directly from the handshake because the server just sends this generic error message back, which is a bit of a pickle, but there are other ways to get more information. Um, other one, uh, unsupported protocol that may mean that the server doesn't understand the TLS protocol, but sometimes when it doesn't understand the TLS protocol version, it also sends the first error message. Uh, again, OS error, it doesn't know what you're doing, maybe just kills you, uh, kills the connection. And um, if you use a newer version of Python, do you have different kinds of protocols on the client side? Maybe you selected the wrong one. So, handshake failure. That's internally version num uh, error number 40. Means, for example, you can't agree on a common cipher suite. The list of ciphers you can speak happens rather often if you update OpenSSL to a new version or install a security update that disables old cipher suites. Unsupported, that can also mean sometimes, I uh, told a couple minutes ago, a minute ago, that the server doesn't know UTLS version or that several of the other parameters you sent to the server is unknown, un not understandable. So you got this error number 40 and a whole bunch of possible ways it can go wrong. And the only way to figure out what goes wrong here if you get that error is, is actually use a tool that just tries different combination of parameters over and over again to give you a hint which kind of cipher suits and TLS versions your server supports. One is a command line tool called SSL scan. So every line you see here, like this reject, fail, anytime you get this line, it means it creates a new network connection, it configures just one version of TLS, SSL, one, one cipher suit, and then gives you the kind of error message. So, and that usually creates like a couple of hundred connections, which looks a lot ugly on the website, on the web server logs, but this is the only way to figure out what's going on. Or if you can have a public service, I totally love this website, that's SSL Labs. So make a small screen recording. Um, it gives you very nice diagnostics. And so here, tested python.org gives you some grading, tells me how the certificate chain looks like, uh, which protocol version I support, and it even gives me not only a list of all the cipher suits, but also different uh, versions of Android, Windows, Mac OS, different browsers, and tells me uh, what they will able to ne negotiate as best selection of cipher suits. Also, it tests for several known attacks and gives you a list, a hint, which kind of vulnerabilities your web server ha has or which um, countermeasures you have to take. Okay, we talked a bit about the cipher suits. Um, I'll give you a very, very short introduction, like three minutes in crypto, to give you some of the steps we have in cipher suits to explain how these ciphers actually build up. And you also need that later on to understand how certificates work, because both for the handshake verification of certificates and the chaining, the signature of certificates, we need public key crypto. It's a small 
very nice IKEA way to explain it. So public key crypto means you have two different parts. You have a, a public key, something you can just hand out to everybody, and you have a private key. That's why it's also called asymmetric crypto. That basically three ways to do asymmetric crypto. There are two ways. One way is you can use your private key to sign a document, or actually the fingerprint, the hash of a document, and people with a public key are able to verify that you have signed that document, not some attacker. That's on the, your, your right side, yes. Or on the uh, left side um, is if uh, somebody can use your public key to encrypt some data, and only the owner of the private key is able to revert that encryption, decrypt the actual encrypted data. So estimated encryption, there are a couple of algorithms. The red ones are the bad ones you shouldn't use. Um, there are also, yeah. Thing is about asymmetric encryption is it's extremely slow. It's a very complex, very lengthy mathematical operation that only can handle a couple of bytes, and it only takes lots of CPU cycles. If you download like large images, videos over the internet, computer games, you don't want to spend that amount of CPU time. So we need another way to encrypt all the information. That's called bulk encryption. Probably heard of them, so these days we use either AES or cha cha 20. Uh, again, the RC4, triple DES, or the DES one are the old ones. And these typically take like a couple of CPU cycles per byte, or even um, CPUs these days, like if you have modern Intel, AMD, or uh, uh, chip, you have dedicated CPU instructions to make AES even faster. So we also need to sign documents or sign certificates. Um, you can use RES for that, or uh, there are several kind of new elliptic curve algorithms. Elliptic curves operate with different kind of math. This is usually faster to operate and make smaller keys, but are secure too. And one very important thing, since signing is also very slow, you have to first hash your document, make it like a fingerprint and then you can sign the hash. The hash is very small, usually like 16 bytes or so, and you can hash like very lengthy documents and then sign this very small uh, hash. And there are also uh, several hashing algorithms. MD5 and SHA-1 are very insecure, don't use them these days. Mostly if you have TLSSL or certificates, it's SHA-2. So, and the Third way to do asymmetric crypto is something called a key agreement protocol or a so-called Diffie-Hellman operation where you can use some tricks to agree on a common secret without sending the secret over the wire with this kind of operation. So Wikipedia explains that it was mixing colors. You have your private color, you have a common public color, you mix your private color with a common color, send it over the wire. The other side adds the same, its own private color to the mix, and they both have the same color at the end. And all these bits and pieces build up the solo code uh, cipher suit. So you have the key agreement to agree on a common pre-master secret. You have something to authenticate the peer. You have the fast bulk encryption, which also sometimes needs a motive operation for block ciphers. And finally, uh, the hash functions you use to verify some of the parameters. And that's the cipher suits. So you can still that through, just go through the first line to keep in time. So the first one is an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman agreement. Uh, use also elliptic curves to authenticate the server. AS with Galois counter mode as block cipher and SHA-384 uh, to verify the connection. That's the official standardized name from the IANA. But if you ever used OpenSSL or configured uh, cipher suits in Python, they look totally different because, well, OpenSSL decided why use standard names? Let's count with our own rules and all names. Uh, they map rather funny so the cipher suit maps to that very short name because they figured out they can just omit lots of bits and pieces for common things. Uh, some map to slightly longer names. You can actually recognize the different bits and pieces. Yeah. 
to you can use the new version of Python, you think Python 3.6, you can use the get cipher tool to configure a cipher suite and then get a list of supported ones. If you work with some kind of governmental bodies, you may also run an additional restrictions result cipher suites called either FIPS, GOST, or uh, the Chinese one. These are standards you should not actually use unless you have to work either for the US government or for the Russian government or the Chinese government or have like restrictions on the market you sell. So a typical Python developer or engineers ignore these, especially don't look into FIPS mode. FIPS mode is uh, a mode to run OpenSSL. You don't need that. So DL Centric part two, just to wrap up what we have learned so far and add that to the mix. So we sent the client hello, the server sent back the server hello, also sends back the certificate chain, which will be the next part of my presentation. And um, in the RSA handshake, the old one we used, the client would just select a secret, encrypt it with the public key code from the server as part of the certificate chain, and then send it over to the server. The server can then use its private key to decrypt the pre-master secret. And finally, they change cipher spec that means they switch over to encrypted communication. This variant had one very big issue. Since a client selects the private, the shared master key and is sent over the wire, if an attacker with lots of hard disks would just record all this information, like for years and years and years, and then somehow get the private key, the attacker would be able to decrypt all traffic for the last decade or even longer. And there are some entities who have big, big disk space somewhere in the desert of wherever. So that's why we these days use a different way. We use the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. That means the server sends back some parameters and sends back his public key to the client and uses his private key of the certificate chain to sign that. And this, the client can then verify this signature with the public key. And it also generates its own diffie helmet private public key pair, sends the public key as the final message. And both have then agreed on a private key. So, and that's the thermal multiple helmet key exchange with the very important step, it's perfect forward secrecy. So it's, uh, since they throw away the keys of each operation, these handshake, uh, attacker can't re record that. Although, actually, in TLS 1 or 2, it's not yet secure. There are actually ways to crack that with session resumption, but that's fixed in TLS 1 or 3. That we'll talk for next year. In Python, you can't get that many information, so I've now used the OpenSSL command line tool to make a connection with um, the cipher suite, the modern one, and um, that's the certificate chain you'll get. I'll come through that in a minute. Some other information you will get, you see which kind of connection it made. And this, it's a bit hard to read, and you don't understand what's going on on the wire, but there's one tool you can look on the wire, what's going on, it's called Wireshark. And I'll show you how cool that tool is. It's another recording. I made a rule to look for port 443, HTTPS Python, uh, made a connection with that command line tool. We're now filtering out, uh, just interested in the uh, TLS communication. We created a connection, TLS 1.2. The wire format TLS 1.0 but that's not that important. Uh, we sent also the host name we're interested to talk to, and the server replies um, with the server hello. We um, yeah, select the cipher suite, we select some other parameters, select the curve. Um, we got a, a certificate chain back. So this is a certificate we got. They sent two back, the end entity cert and an intermediate cert with lots of additional information. Uh, we also now have the key exchange. So you see if the uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange for elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, that's a public key. There's the signature uh, with the private key of the server. 
and then the client um, verified the information, also the client key exchange sent its public key, and at the moment we switched to encrypted communication, and that's the handshake. And this is one of my favorite tools to look into communication, but you need a, uh, um, a GUI program, the Gravel user interface, which makes it not suitable for servers, but in the beginning I talked about TCP dump. You can use TCP dump to dump network communication in your server to a file as a root user, download that file to your um, desktop computer and use that tool to diagnose that. Okay, we have like 12 minutes left. It's enough for certificates. So we have the handshake. We have the pre-master secret agreed. Now we need some way to verify that we talk to the right server, not to some kind of attacker, mail in the middle attack. And the whole verification process is done with something called certificates or public key infrastructure, PKI. The standard behind PKI is also a very old standard from the 80s. It's called X509 certificates. Uh, X509 are encoded in an also old standard called ASN1. Uh, with different representation. Most of you, you have seen, if you have looked at a certificate or private key, something that looks like base64 encoded data with the begin and header block. That's just actually base64 encoded raw ASN1. And these certificates always come in a pair of certificates and private keys. One way to look at certificates, oh, and there's also additional information I'll run through in a minute. To look at a certificate, there's a tool uh, for text-based consoles uh, in OpenSSL2, so OpenSSL X509. Uh, if you use the dash text option, you get the whole human readable text. If you use no out, then you don't get the certificate again. So it's a bit confusing, but yeah. And you get information like that, certificate. So you get some data. First of all, they have a, a version number. These days you will only see version three ones, except if you create your own ones without certain extensions. They have a serial number. That's a randomly selected number. They used to be in serial, but there were attacks, and with random selected serial numbers, uh, it's a bit more secure for the CA. Uh, certificates are always signed by somebody, so if you sign your name in there, they're valid for a certain period. Uh, with Let's Encrypt, you typically have, I think, three months. Yeah, give or take three months. And there's also the subject, that's the name of the entity that requested the certificate. That's the certificate for the EuroPython website, which actually has not the common name, so CN stands for common name, uh, EP2018. Well, it's later embedded in the certificate. And finally, we have the public key with some additional information. That first block I shown you, that's actually the version one information. If you have additional extensions, the X59 version three extension, then the version three certificates, which all certificates these days have. They have like a key usage, how to use the certificate. Um, digital signature means you can use the Diffie-Hellman key exchange and sign the uh, secret. Key in cipherman means somebody can use the certificate to encrypt the key. So this certificate you can use both kinds of encryption and signing. Without these you wouldn't be allowed to sign. Other fields you can have on that is like signing uh, CAs, signing revocation lists, etc. You also have an extended key usage which typically is web server, something the web client. You can also have extended key usage for signing code. Uh, CA false, so that one is not a CA certificate, it's an ent entity certificate. Uh, identifiers to build up the chain and uh, some ways to get the certificate. OCSP is uh, online certificate revocation protocol, a uh, status protocol. And finally, a list of names that certificate's valid for. And at the end, that one is signed by a CA. That's a signature. So um, we have three different major types you see in web browsers. 
you have first of all the trust anchors, or, uh, trust anchors or so-called root CAs. These are self-signed certificates that can pre-install with a web browser or with your operating system. And these are fully trusted certificates. So then you have intermediate CAs. These are also CAs that are already signed by other one. You can have one, two, or just a chain of them. We use intermediate CAs to keep the root CAs locked away securely. So the intermediate CAs are typically in special hardware devices, and the root CAs, the keys printed out on paper and stored in a vault securely and not even on a hard disk for security reasons. And finally, the server certificate or the uh, more technical term is ent entity certificate. These form a, a chain. So the root CA signs the immediate one, the next one signs the next one, and finally the ent entity certificate is the one you have on your machine. And you have to post the web server to send the whole chain back. So I just skipped through that. There's a different field you can have. It's going to be a bit more, too much time to explain that. So the chain. Yes, you can see here the another output of the L tool from other conference. I presented the slides at. You first have the your end entity certificate for your website. Then you have the next intermediate one, and the root one will stay. Uh, so on your browser installed. And just in case, just in case you wonder, sometimes you see this big green bar. That's called a standard validation certificate. This is just some additional fields on the certificate. Um, they use an extra process to validate you, but these are not special certificates other than they have this additional field. And one thing I want to point out, please keep your private keys secure and don't throw them like in the bin. So one of the most common things that can go wrong with um, verification is you get that kind of error message, the most annoying one. And too bad if you still use Python 3.6 or uh, Python 2.7, you won't get any more information back from Python. 3.7 is improved. I added some extra code. But you just get something went wrong. So you have to use an external tool called from OpenSSL, for example, to diagnose that. So it's S-Client. You connect to the S-Client. So he used bad SSL, which is a nice collection of um, Erinos certificates or something is wrong. And for that case, I also have to send the host name I want to connect to. And I'll get error messages back. For example, here, certificate has expired. And I'm going through several of the error messages you make, come back, and give you some hints what can go wrong. So one thing is, obviously, cert has expired. Um, so you have to get a new certificate somehow. Sometimes, more rarely, you get something like, it's not valid yet, that often means that your clock is wrong. So if you have learned like Raspberry Pi would don't have clocks on the ship, on the die, you have to use an external clock source. If something goes wrong, then you get that error message. If you generate your own ones, you may get some kind of very funky error message with handshake failure. Um, these don't happen if you get official certificates. On the client side, if you connect to a server and have some kind of issues with the, the actual chain, uh, there can be multiple issues you can have. Um, the one if you run test certificates and you get self-signed certificate as error message, that, um, then you have enabled uh, SSL verification, but that didn't add the certificate to your trust store or had some issue with your test certificate. Unable to verify the first certificate in the chain is in almost all cases I have witnessed that the issue that the server doesn't send you back the whole chain, only the end entity certificate. So it's slightly misconfigured. Browsers can work around that. You can use information from the certificate to look up the chain and build that on their own. It's called AA chasing. Uh, tools like Python and any kind of command line tools typically don't do that. 
so you uh, have to fix your server. Unable to local, uh, get local issue certificate is a sign that you don't have the root CA loaded. Perhaps it's not installed, perhaps you're missing the way you get the root certificates. So you have to load them somehow. And there are multiple places where the certificate can be stored. Or sometimes you get the also a self-signed error message which is often a sign that the server sent also the root CA back, but you don't trust the root CA. So the server can optionally send as part of the chain also root CA, um, but if you don't trust it, then it looks like this self-signed error again. And if you update to Python 3 or 7, well, you get actually a much better error message. Actually get the same information you would see in OpenSSL. So here, for example, unable to get local issue certificate. You're welcome. I was annoyed too. I was really annoyed and it, it wasn't that hard to add that. I wanted to figure out how to do that. So root CAs. Root CAs can be stored in different places depending on your operating system or be not available at all. So Linux or BSD is typically some file that's compiled into OpenSSL. So if you compile your open, own OpenSSL, it may not work. Requests also have the certify package which just packages certificates which get rid of the error but have other issues. On Windows, added a hack to add certificates from the Windows search store which does not work properly if you have a newly installed machine. I didn't know that before. I want to edit that and on macOS you can only have to install certify uh, if you use the official installers because internally Mac, Apple uses an um, a patch OpenSSL, we can't use that trick with Python.org installers. On Linux, they may be, so uh, vendors have never agreed on a specific location, so you can um, have a long list of places you can look. Um, in, we don't have that list in, in, in the SSL model in Python, but you can use this small tool, small helper functions to get a list, also ways to override that. Uh, so it set, can set environment variables. So I mentioned that I'm not a big fan of certify because you have to keep your certify package updated. If you don't do that, you may run into some issues I found in um, New Relic a while ago. They had a very ancient version of certify and requests with very with outdated invalid uh, certificates. So just the Final one, hosting verification, because I have just one minute left. So we also have to verify the host name matches the certificate that uses this subject alternative name extension. And I had multiple issues to get that right in Python, uh, the engineer, there's so many ways this thing could go wrong. We had like six major bugs, several CVE, six CVEs, uh, several major bugs, and now we um, use OpenSSL for that, so OpenSSL added this new feature. Uh, also, LibreSSL added that uh, until, yeah. Yeah, I found a bug in LibreSSL while I work on Python 7 And that CV actually paid for some fancy medicine for my then sick cat. So thank you, LibreSSL, you paid the vet. And final remark is, if you do HTTP, you have to be sure that you use the same host name for both the server name indicator and the actual GET request. So, TS-103, out of time? Yeah, out of time. <laughs> so, skip that. Uh, summary, so, some of the tools you can use. And I highly recommend to get one of these books, especially the Bulletproof TLS SSL. And I'm right on time.